Well, good afternoon, everyone. I will speak quickly and try to get us back on time. So I'm going to talk today about a very important topic, um, an area that's near and dear to my heart, certainly, which is uh, metabolic disease. I'm also going to approach this uh, from the angle of testosterone deficiency. Um, what you will see through the course of the presentation today is that there really are um, some very important aspects of metabolic disease that are governed by androgen deficiency, testosterone deficiency, in particular in men. Um, and there are a number of points that I, I do want to make today. One important point uh, that you will hear throughout the presentation, and that is that hypogonadism um, is really a clinical diagnosis. And yes, it's very important to check, evaluate, assess not only the response to testosterone therapy, testosterone restoration, but also it's very important to listen to your patient um, remember, the diagnosis of hypogonadism is a clinical diagnosis. So let's talk a little bit about the conventional view or the conventional approach to testosterone therapy. Uh, A4M is a very cutting-edge organization. You will hear very cutting-edge ideas over the course of the next several days. Unfortunately, uh, it seems to be taking a while for the conventional medical community to really catch up to some of these ideas. So let's talk a little bit about this uh, in reference to testosterone. So an important concept is uh, testosterone therapy. How is it viewed by the conventional medical community? Um, one is that there appear to be uncertain benefits and so-called certain risks. Many in the audience, I think, would agree with me and certainly remember that, in fact, um, not until, I would say, fairly recently, there was a belief that testosterone itself increased cardiovascular risk. Just by a show of hands, how many people remember that? Okay. So as certainly some of the uh, older practitioners in the audience remember that. But for many years, there was a real concern that, in fact, testosterone increased cardiovascular risk. Well, we know from a number of very elegant studies that, in fact, testosterone has beneficial effects on the endothelium. How many people are familiar with the term endothelial dysfunction or endothelial function? Very good. Um, relatively cutting-edge concept in cardiovascular medicine. Testosterone appears to enhance cardio uh, cardiovascular function, including endothelial function. We will also spend some time today talking about uh, those so-called certain risks particularly in the relationship between prostate health, prostate cancer, which is certainly an important topic. Um, fairly complex, there was some recent data I'm sure many of you are aware about uh, that came out, I'll say probably about uh, four to six weeks ago, questioning the value of PSA. Um, if we have time, through the, the end of the conversation today, I do want to talk about that. Uh, what I would agree with on this slide is the third bullet, and there does appear, unfortunately or regrettably, to still be some ambiguity associated with the uh, diagnosis and indications for hypogonadism. I will present some data to you over the course of the talk today um, that really is alarming, and it involves the diagnosis. In fact, I would characterize it as the under-treatment of hypogonadism, some really stunning information. So there's also another view, and um, I think we also need to talk about this as well. And I characterize this as a gunslinger's viewpoint, if you will, which is when we're young, we have lots of testosterone floating around in our bodies. When we get older, we tend to have low levels. So let's just blast away and get those levels up to very, very high, um, high levels. Well, I think the key, and one of the things that you'll hear over the course of the, the next few days, hormone restoration is all about, one word, balance. And there is an optimal level uh, of various hormones and an optimal balance. And I think this is an important concept to understand. Let's talk a little bit about some of the data around the prevalence of hypogonadism. Um, there are a couple points with this slide. One is fairly obvious, and you'll see that over time, the risk or the prevalence of hypogonadism increases. Furthermore, if you look at total testosterone versus free testosterone, there is a difference there in terms of the criteria, the threshold that are used to actually define hypogonadism, again, in context with clinical symptoms as well. But you'll notice here, and I believe as uh, I recollect that this study used a threshold or a cut point 
uh, for testosterone, I think it was 325 nanograms per deciliter. That was for total testosterone, of course. But look at the percentage over time. Look at the 80-year-olds. Um, it, it's very, very high prevalence of hypogonadism if indeed a free testosterone level or free T index is used. This I thought was an interesting slide. I want to spend a little time talking about this more in terms of speculation. You notice over the past three decades, 30 years, there does appear to be a decline over time in testosterone levels in men. Now, we can speculate on what may be occurring, but I'll also add that this data has been corrected for other confounding variables. So then the question is, what's going on here? Are we seeing an environmental influence? Perhaps. Um, is this alarming? I think this is certainly uh, disturbing or concerning. I think to me the real question is why? And perhaps at the end we can, we can talk a little bit more about that and speculate why we're seeing this. And again, it's not just age. We know that the population is getting older. But we're seeing, uh, and this is a median level, as I recollect, over time, we're seeing this decline. And it's an important consideration of why. We know that there is an association between low levels of serum testosterone and mortality. This was a study that I pulled uh, three years ago from the Archives of Internal Medicine. And they determined certain cut points. The cut point here was 250 nanograms per deciliter. This was for total testosterone. And you, if you look at this, the uh, cut points that were used, two standard deviations above and below, pretty robust um, uh, values in terms of um, uh, mortality here. And it results in a relative increase in around 70%. So the focus of today's discussion really is about low testosterone, testosterone deficiency, suboptimal testosterone levels, and metabolic problems, including diabetes and obesity. This uh, slide was uh, pulled from or copied from the HIMSS study. It was published a few years back, three years ago in 2006. And I'll call your attention to a couple of point points. Um, one thing that our epidemiology colleagues will share with us is that if you see odds ratios for certain associations, and we all know that epidemiology data does not test for causality, correct? We're looking at associations. So one of the things, uh, a statistical trick, if you will, is if you're seeing odds ratios that are above 2.0, essentially above 100% increased risk, um, there is a greater likelihood that that association may turn out to have causal relationships. So I mention that to really pique your interest, but also to point out, look at obesity and diabetes. Those two are above an odds ratio of 